Um, <clears throat> I worked for a very tiny company called Naughty Guide. There's only two of us. Um, I formed it years and years and years ago um, with an aim to build services around geospatial data. And we've kind of had a roller coaster ride over the years. And we're in a strange position at the moment is that most companies try and expand and rule the world. And we've done the opposite is we've contracted. Um, I'm in my late 50s. It's kind of time for me to wind down. And we're um, attempting to move from a complete closed source model to a completely open source model um, for all of our software, um, which sounds really easy that all you do is put it up on GitHub and let everybody look at it. Uh, but it's actually incredibly hard to derive revenue streams um, and ongoing business from. But we'll get there in the end. And part of our work is um, to create um, a data ecosystem to help people discover data around activities and well-being. Um, I'm a really keen cyclist. Um, I know the benefit of exercise. Um, and so what me and myself, my business partner, have been doing um, over the past year is collating activity data. Um, we get it from all sorts of different sources, um, from open standards, such as Open Active, or UK Referral, um, from green space data, from data we scrape from the web, um, and various other sources. We pull this all into one place, uh, and we publish it through a schema that we've created. And the system's called Lucaria. Um, and um, I hope to, that the URL there that you'll see on the slides, I um, hope to have a demo up next week where you'll be able to go and have a look at it and, and see kind of what I'm talking about and understand the, the context of it. But simplistically, we're trying to make it easy for anyone to discover data, um, um, things that they can do to make them more active or to make them feel better. Um, it, there's a mock-up of it. It's not a mock-up. That's actually a live screen of how it kind of works. You can see it's, we've got items on the map and um, items that you can then click with and go and investigate. Um, and this being a geospatial conference, well, how do you get items on a map? Well, you give them locations, and that's part of our problem. We actually built this system a year ago, and we built it in Node.js, and um, we then um, got a prototype of it running. And we then started building admin screens in the back end. And we then started um, working on our data loaders. And um, for our particular use case, we really struggled. We, we found um, that React and Node.js and JavaScript and the various libraries just weren't working for us at all. Um, and part of that reason is I still don't understand how promises work for anyone who is a JavaScript programmer. Um, and we, we got three quarters of the way down that path and then started looking at frameworks. And we came across a framework called Django. And Django is a framework written in Python. Being a geospatialist, obviously, Python is comfort zone for me. Um, and we looked into this framework and we found that we'd probably be a better place to do what we wanted to do in Django. So that's what we did. We chucked all of our Node.js stuff away and we rewrote it. And we're just about finished. Um, and the reason we chose Django uh, for all of those lovely reasons down there, I said it's in Python. I find it easier than JavaScript. You make your own choice on that one. Um, but what Django does is it separates your, um, your data into models uh, and your um, uh, UI or your API face, um, uh, um, uh, facing services into, into views. And it does that well, in my view. Um, it's, it's easy to understand and it's very easy to code, as I'll kind of demonstrate later on. You can extend it. You can build um, in Django. You can build little mini apps, and that's what we've done. Um, people talk about microservices. Well, what we've done is created apps. So our Lucaria system is just a series of little apps that do their own thing, and they all kind of work together. It's really easy to containerize. So when you want to make it live, we simply chuck it into a Docker container. Um, uh, we put it up into AWS LightCell and uh, give it a domain name and away it goes. Um, and we find that very, very simple um, from where we used to be with serverless and all sorts of other horrible CI scripts. Um, there is massive community support. I, I, every time I, I think, oh, I'll write that little component in Django, I go on to um, DuckDuckGo, notice what I said there, and I find someone else has done this. Um, or if I have a problem, I can find someone in the community who can kind of help me out. Um, you've got to admit, it's a damn cool name, Django Unchained. Has anyone seen that film? It's amazing. You know, it's better than React, Svelte, View, Django. It sounds, it sounds good. What do you do? I do Django. Yeah, I can say that in the pub. 
not sure I can say I do spelt. <coughs> there, there we go. Um, the database abstraction on it is really good. I'll show that in a minute. And the thing that really made it for us is that out of the box, you get an admin system for managing your data. Um, it's not the nicest looking admin system, but it works. And so we can create front ends that look gorgeous and back ends where we can manage the data in the front ends. We've written no code to, to build those back ends. Django's kind of done it for us. Um, but this is a geospatial conference, so hang on, Dave. Where's the geo bit? Well, <clears throat> Django comes with a module called Geo Django. And what Geo Django does is all of the things that we want it to do with our geospatial data. So it extends the Django models to include geospatial types like point fields, multi polygon fields, raster fields. It includes um, all of the operations that we would um, uh, normally use through PostGIS or through Python libraries, such as nearest or um, reprojection of, um, of geometries. Um, and it also includes, quite importantly, um, geometry admin. So I talked about the admin system. You get that with GeoDjango um, and editors. Uh, oops, I need to go the other way. Um, so, for example, <clears throat> here's a model that I've created in GeoDjango. Uh, it is basically saying what I want <clears throat> is a database table, and it's going to have a name, and it's going to have a point field. Please, can you go and do that for me, GeoDjango? And I ran a simple command, and GeoDjango has created the table for me. It's created the table space for me. And it's also created the index because it's intelligently thought Dave's going to forget to create a geometry index. So I'm going to make one for him. Um, GeoDjango supports most of the spatial databases that we know and love. So if you're using PostGIS, your life is going to be beautiful. If you're using Oracle, your life is going to be beautiful but expensive. If you're using Spatialite, your life is going to be beautiful, but you'll never get it installed locally. And if you're using MySQL, you're an it no, I shouldn't say that. You're um, butting your head against something that is going to be very difficult, but it will work. And so there you can see how it makes it nice and easy for me to manage my models. And it also gives me this admin screen out of the box. So I wrote, that many lines of code to create this administration screen. And all it said was, in my admin backend, <clears throat> I want to be able to edit the name and the geometry fields. <clears throat> and GeoDjango gave me a lovely name box here, and it gave me a map, and I can click on that map, and it will create me a point, because that was a point field. And I can click on the point, and I can move it, and it will move it around, and I can click Save, <clears throat> and it will save that. And I can also click Add, and it will allow me to create a new record. Um, and it won't allow me to save a record unless I've done a name and a geometry, because I told it that uh, those were mandatory. Brilliant. So suddenly, I've gone from thousands of lines of code and open layers and map box and what have you to create this to a simple um, uh, admin class. Now, <clears throat> let's come on to our Lucaria system. As I said earlier, we ingest a whole load of event data from all over the country. And um, the vast majority of people that publish event data are not as clever as us because they're not geospatialists. So what do they do with their location fields? Well, they just put postcodes in there. <clears throat> and they assume that we'll be able to just stick that on a map um, without any extra work. But as geospatialists, we know that it's just text. It is not coordinates. <clears throat> if we're going to put stuff on a map, we want some coordinates. So that's what our geocoder is going to do. And our lovely friends, where's Hannah from Ordnance Survey, um, have a lovely data set of postcodes uh, and place names, which they call open names. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, geo our postcode, and we're looking, going to look it up in open names. And open names is going to give us some coordinates. <clears throat> and we're then going to use those coordinates to put our postcode on the map. This, is, um, uh, this means that we need to create a model for the um, Ordnance Survey open data. And Ordnance Survey's um, um, open names uh, data set has many more fields than the simple one that I created. So we're going to have to add fields like um, name one, name two. Why on earth do you do that? I don't understand what name one is. 
the, um, uh, the language for it, the, the geometry for it. Um, uh, uh, and um, also, we're going to have to do another little bit of work is because we're going to be looking up a postcode, <clears throat> and a postcode in the Ordnance Survey data set has type postcode, um, and we're going to need an index. And so this is how we tell GeoDjango to create an index. It's just several lines of Python that say, um, I'm going to have a where clause that says where local type is postcode, and I want you to index the name one field, which is where the postcode lives in the Ordnance Survey open data. So basically, it's relatively simple. Create a model, <clears throat> run a command, and that will be set up in my PostGIS database. Next, I need to load the data in. <clears throat> and what Django gives you is a command system that allows you to create commands um, uh, that run across um, your, your instance. And this is great because the, um, it's a class-based um, uh, piece of code. So you can inherit from their base command class and your command will get um, the ability to receive parameters. It, all the database connections will be taken care of for you. Um, you'll have access to all the models and, and everything that you need. You simply need to write to extend that class and you've got a command. So what I'm going to do is write a command to download and install and unload the um, Ordnance Survey open data. Um, and that's relatively simple to do. Um, I write a handle method. And Django goes, oh, yes, that's what I'm going to run when I run Dave's command. And that handle method is going to download the data from Ordnance Survey's data hub. Um, I'm going to download it in geo package format. So uh, my command is going to un unpack that geo package. Um, and then because there's a huge amount of data, I'm going to use the fantastic OGR to OGR command to inject it straight into my Django database. Um, I could use the Django commands to do that, but it's very inefficient because I'll get an SQL query for every single record. Um, now, Ordnance Survey actually give you some um, Python code to help you with this. But the one moan I will have is that their data is downloaded in zip format. And so I then had to write a whole load of wrappers around it to um, manage the unzip side of it, which ended up being um, making it more worthwhile me writing my own code. So I've got a competing library to Ordnance Surveys that's better because it does the unzip bit. Uh, anyway, so my data is in the, in the database now. How do I write a geocoder? And this is really quite simple, is that in my Django um, system, uh, I can create a function or a class. And I'm going to create one called geocoder. And I'm going to pass it a postcode. <coughs> And it's just going to have to do a few little bits of jiggery pokery. Um, Ordnance Survey store the postcodes in open names with a space in an uppercase. And people, when they type postcodes into a postcode field, expect to be able to type it without the space sometimes. So what I'm going to do <coughs> is I'm going to take all the spaces out of the postcode, just because they also put too many in sometimes. <coughs> and I'm going to reformat it into that outward and inward format, make it uppercase, and then this one line here writes all of my SQL and handles it for me. It simply says, go to my open names model, get me um, the postcode that matches that using a local type of postcode, which we set an index for earlier. Uh, and that is as simple as it, as, it, as it gets. So in my code, I simply need to say, my point, pass it this postcode to the geocoder function, and that will return me a point. And uh, that point will have coordinates, an X and Y coordinate. Um, I can use all of the GeoDjango libraries to transform it into different coordinate systems, et cetera, et cetera. So you can see it's nice and easy um, to do. But Django gives you more than that, <coughs> because whilst that has helped if um, uh, I want to um, look up a postcode in my code, what about if I want to publish as an API to an internal department? What about if I want to search further into the um, open name structure? So I wanted to be able to search in Welsh, because they do store Welsh variants of names. Um, or I wanted to be able to search on the name to field or, or do that. Um, but there's this amazing module that we use all the time 
called, um, very beautifully named and eloquently, because I obviously talk about this one in the pub a lot, Django Elasticsearch DSL DRF. And what it means is, hey Dave, I'm going to take your data, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to allow you to put it into an Elasticsearch uh, data store, which for anyone that's come across it, is a, or anyone that hasn't, is a really great way of searching freeform text across loads of different fields. Um, and um, I'm going to make it really easy for you, Dave, to publish that as a REST API um, that has all sorts of different filters on it um, and all sorts of different search parameters. And in order to do that, I really I need to create three files. A file that describes how my um, uh, uh, document is, is going to come out in the system. So that means when I do a search, what am I going to get back? What's my JSON API result going to look like? Um, a URL, so what's my endpoint going to be? I don't know, location, slash search, slash postcode. And something called a view set. Um, and um, the, 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 the view set describes um, any filters that I may want to apply to that. Um, uh, or um, any special um, queries that I may want to add into the system. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the detail of this, but I'm going to say that with that library and literally 50 lines of code, I can publish um, an API that is more functional than Ordnance, Service, uh, Ordnance Survey's names API because they've got limited filters and they can't do a free text search down the whole of the um, open name structure. Using this, I, I can. Very, very performant. Um, and with amazing filters. So you can have geospatial filters on there. You can have wildcard filters on there. Um, you can have date ranges. You know, you can have numeric ranges, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, why would you do this when Ordnance Survey um, publish their own API? Uh, well, um, because you may not want it in their format. <clears throat> you may want to add more data to it. Uh, what I do with my postcodes is I mix ONS and Ordnance Survey data because I find when you mix the two, you get a much wider postcode set. They update on um, different frequencies and, and, and different levels. Um, and there's no usage restrictions at all. But I'm not saying you shouldn't use the OS API, because if you just want to do an API, it's, it's really easy. Um, and there are other things you can do as well. <clears throat> Is Django includes something, um, uh, there's a module called Django Unicorn. And Django Unicorn is basically um, a, um, a library that allows you to make really lightweight front-end components that you can call from HTML. And so in our system, we've got a type ahead search where you can type a name in a box and it will give you the candidates which you can select from. And um, you won't be able to read it because it's too small, sorry, but that is the HTML that is needed to create that, that box. And that is using something called Unicorn. And this is the line here that basically connects that box to the backend model. And the backend model handles all of the processing. So everything I type into here gets passed into there. And if the value of search text changes, it re-renders the HTML here. So I type in here, it sends that to that component. That component changes it at the back end, re-renders this HTML, my drop-down list appears, and I can kind of click on, on, on all of that stuff. Um, and this is great for people like me who don't like JavaScript because <coughs> I can do it all in HTML and I can have all of my um, uh, processing stuff kind of happen on the back end. So that's really all, all I wanted to cover. It's um, uh, hopefully a... Um, you get what I'm talking about. I don't think anyone's asleep um, at the moment, so I think I might have done okay there. Just meant to give you kind of an overview of how we do things. I'm not saying it's the right way to do things. Um, the things that you can do in a very small amount of code. Um, that geocoder is available on GitHub. There's a link there. I think our presentations will be available on the, on the web afterwards. Um, go and have a look at the, the code there. And if you want to know anything more um, about anything that I've talked about there, just grab me here afterwards and have a chat. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. So, as a small, small, medium business company and enterprise, how do you, how do you feel about uh, microservices in AWS? Isn't it too complicated to, to, to like understand their billing costs and stuff like that? Uh, we, uh, yes and no. Yes and no. <laughs> the, we um, we use a lot of their microservices. And we use them because because we have to because we're so small we haven't got time to build them ourselves. So, for example, um, one of the things we've done in our portal is we translate the results on the fly. So um, when we receive events um, from uh, uh, various APIs, and if we're publishing them to Wales, we can on the fly translate that event into Welsh, which is and it is expensive, but it's less expensive than if we did it ourselves. Um, I, I, what the, my beef with AWS is, is mainly around documentation, but I kind of understand it because they've got so many thousands of microservices. It just must be a task in itself keeping those, those, those up to date. Yeah, so at our, our company, we were using AWS, but it was too complicated to understand it. So everything kind of ended up on EC2, to be honest. So now we are moving to Azure because yeah. their billing and their documentation is much easier to understand. So second and last question is, why AWS? Why? Why AWS? Well, because we we now understand it, and and and, and, um, and also because um, some of their services um, that, that, that we've used in AWS have been much more performant and uh, ahead of the curve than um, Azure and Google. So we use yeah, we're big cool. users of RDS, and, and AWS are way ahead in terms of Postgres. Um, and you know we tried using the Google um, the cloud um, offering from from Google, and it was terrible. It was absolutely you know we were versions behind. Um, and AWS has extended Postgres, and they had access to S3 and stuff like that. So, a lot of their stuff is um, is kind of ahead of the curve than the others. You know, with Azure, I guess if you're using um, SQL Server, then fine, that, 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 that that's going to work for you. But if you're a Postgres user, yeah. I'm not convinced you're you're in the right place. Yeah, fair enough. Thank you very much, sir. <laughs> Um, just a technical question, really. With your um, with the Django Elasticsearch module, does that actually run the Elasticsearch server as well, or is it just for the data loading into the server? No, you set up the server, and then yeah. that's it. Okay. Um, oh, right, okay. But what yeah. it does is the best thing it does is um, <clears throat> the hardest the hardest problem with Elasticsearch is index is creating your document index. It's really hard if you if you trying to come at that ground up. But um, the Django module obfuscates that all for you. You describe a document in simple Python. Um, and then it goes away and it runs the index. Not only that, it runs um, keeping it up to date. So if you delete an item from your database, it removes it from the index. Um, if you update it, it updates the index. It's, it's really, really good right, for that. I'll check it out. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello. And um, it's just uh, more uh, sharing rather than a question, but um, this... Uh, um, Backend driven uh, idea or, or, or reality that uh, you are telling us is, is great, but um, uh, would you uh, your uh, infrastructure or your um, implementation would work if you ever need to go uh, back to a more front end driven uh, application uh, with more interaction by the user or um, what about OGC traditional services such as WMS WFS. Um, um, would your would your um, Django uh, driven application would be able to cope with um, something like your server um, on top of that? Um, um, yeah, yeah, it's very easy to separate front and back end in Django. What some people do is, and it's entirely valid, is they use Django for the model and the back end, and then they use React, Svelte, Vue, what have you, um, on the front end. Okay. So if it, um, you kind of have to do with what you're comfortable with. I, I, I hate being told that I'm using the wrong stack. I'm yeah. using exactly the right stack yeah. Yeah, for me. Um, may not be for you, but for yeah. me, it's perfect. And, and yeah. I think what we liked about Django is that the two of us, I'm a back-end developer, and so I'm really in my comfort zone here. And my business partner's a front-end developer, and so he's in his comfort zone as well, because he's finding doing the back end bits easier than it used to be. Mm, okay. um, and his SQL is a disgrace. And, and now it's not, because he didn't write any, because he, 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 he can't. <laughs> okay. No, it's, it's great that you are giving us uh, some hope for uh, the people like um, we think that we, c we can do things outside the front end domain. So yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs>